Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. The Peruvian polygonal stone walls, said by academics to be created by the Inca, but by many other researchers to be pre-Inca, remain one of the world's most incredible ancient mysteries. How they were built is a subject that will likely always be debated. From stacking one stone on top of another, and rubbing it back and forth so it fits perfectly with the one below, to moulding the blocks with an acid, to a form of geopolymer concrete and so on. Many of us have an opinion, but many more of us do concede it's a real mystery. These interconnecting blocks known as polygonal masonry are often accompanied by the famous nubs, and there is a thriving community of researchers interacting on Twitter every day who do like to discuss this phenomenon, again another mystery that I would love to be solved. Polygonal masonry and nubbed blocks are found across the world, spanning many continents and time periods, and there does seem to be an ancient technique of stone building that looks to have been long forgotten. I personally don't think that all of the nubs are from the same process or had the same function at every site around the world. I imagine that some are in place for climbing, to give ancient people a footing to climb large structures. I imagine that some were for adding timber frames to walls, maybe fixtures and fittings. Some were to stop the blocks from getting damaged, protuberances that would take the pressure if the blocks fell to the floor or hit another block. I do imagine that some were for lifting, whilst others have other purposes I've not considered, but I think the ones of Peru do directly relate to the creation of the stone structures. I believe they relate to how the people created the walls we see. The nubs are often in the wrong position on the blocks to be useful for lifting, and some also have a flat edge on top of the nub and not on the bottom, so saying that all nubs are for lifting purposes is somewhat lazy and nonsensical. If you're like me, you're looking for answers. I do like to try and contribute something to progress various subjects to the next level. Whether my information and ideas are right or wrong, I just hope it makes people think. I don't just like to accept something as a mystery. These ancient structures were built by humans, and so I look at it as something that needs to be solved. And surely we should have the historical, archaeological and scientific resources to get us closer to the truth. I have to admit, I haven't read all the information available on the subject, I've not seen all of the videos on YouTube, and all of the pictures available, and many more people are far more knowledgeable on polygonal masonry and nubs than me. What I do know is that what we see in Peru is probably the best example of polygonal masonry in the world, because the joints between the blocks are especially incredible, and the rock types are often far harder than the soft limestone examples we see in places like ancient Egypt. Although yes, they do have granite examples as well, as seen by the casing stones on the Menkore Pyramid. So, the purpose of this video is to try and add something to the discussion that I hope people will find worthwhile, and it focuses on the Peruvian stone walls. Firstly, we know the masonry is sometimes either polygonal or megalithic or both in nature. We find large standalone blocks, we find large blocks sometimes stacked together or sometimes with smaller blocks, and we find structures that are also made up of more manageable sized blocks. We know that some blocks, but not all, do have nubs in a seemingly random arrangement, although usually at the bottom of a block. But we also know that a lot of blocks show signs of vitrification, having a glassy appearance especially on joints and outer surfaces. Vitrified stones are stones that have been melted to a point where they form a glass or a glaze. In Peru, this is something undeniable but little understood, and it is likely that a lot of glaze on the stones has worn away over time. There are also other signs of heat application to the Peruvian stone walls, features that really do look like the stone has been melted. Glassy rocks can form naturally where you have high temperatures and pressures. You can also create glass or glaze in furnaces or kilns, by pasting finely crushed stones onto fired pots and plates. Temperatures needed are often higher than 1000 degrees centigrade. 
The stones of Peru don't look to have been individually vitrified before the final walls were created, and of course the walls are too large to place inside a kiln to create a glaze. But melting the stones could explain the precise nature of the joints and the vitrification we see. Many researchers have said way before me that the stone blocks look to have been affected by extreme heat, but rather than this being caused by some solar airburst or comet at the Younger Dryas, what if this was actually part of the process of building the walls we see? What if the walls were finished with extreme heat to create the perfect joints and a pleasing vitreous finish? The reason I'm thinking about this is because I've been reading about the vitrified stones that make up the ancient Iron Age forts in Britain and Europe, with most examples being found in Scotland. We see vitrified ramparts and stone walls that have clearly been subjected to extreme heat, with blocks fused together without the addition of mortar. Some stones are partially melted and calcinated, other blocks have their edges firmly fused, and some blocks look to be brand new, created by the addition of the heat. Interestingly, some blocks are enveloped in a glassy enamel-like coating, and some entire lengths of wall are like one solid mass of vitreous substance. I've just read a paper by Colin Donaldson et al of St Andrews University about the vitrified rocks of Dunnock Hill Fort in Dunning, Perthshire. It is thought to date between 800 and 400 BC. The vitrified stones are sometimes rounded, sometimes angular, with one or more flat surfaces, and almost all the stones are irregular. There are no tool marks that suggest artificial shaping. Most samples of vitrified rocks at this fort are sandstone, made up of grains of quartz and feldspar, as well as mica and clays. They display a slightly yellow-green glaze that thinly coats the rock with a depth of 1-3mm, to three millimeters, giving the stones an unusual smooth surface. Beneath the glaze, the original red sandstone has lost its colour and it now looks grey with a shiny black glass holding the quartz and feldspar grains together. It now looks a bit like pitchstone, and there are vesicles or bubbles in the matrix. There are also samples of vitrified sandstone embedded within fresh basalt in one stone. Interestingly, the paper says that one specific sample found consists of several separate angular grey chunks of partially melted sandstone embedded in fresh black basalt. On the surface of the stone, the basalt forms smooth and very fine-grained, but not glassy, tongue-like knobs. The paper says that the shape of these knobs are reminiscent of driblets of basalt that escape from the front of a very fluid basalt lava flow, forming smooth surface, sac-like tongues of rock. Yes, straight away I'm reminded of Peru. Where the basalt meets the sandstone in the rock, the basalt is slightly finer grained, showing that the basalt cooled against the sandstone blocks. So, the igneous basalt has melted by unnatural means, by human intervention. It flowed into the spaces between the loose sandstone and recrystallized. There are also very fresh samples of basalt by themselves, which show evidence of being melted and vitrified, and not from the simple cooling of natural lava. Now, these samples from Iron Age Europe are very different to the Peruvian stone walls, but I think that one can certainly help us to understand the other. As stated by Antonio Zamora in a video on his channel, the vitrified rocks of European forts is not on purpose. It looks accidental due to the lack of uniformity of the vitrification. I really can't say that word. Vitrific vitrification. It was not the application of heat in a controlled manner, but it clearly looks to be accidental fire damage. It likely came about from the enormous temperatures from fires that affected the fort when the thatch and wooden structures of the fort caught fire, the wooden watchtowers that topped the stone walls. By catching fire, the dropped ash onto the walls and ramparts below acted as a flux to lower the temperature needed to cause the vitrification we see. Check out Zamora's video for more detailed explanation, which I've linked below in the description, because he does offer some fantastic information. The reason I'm discussing the Iron Age vitrified forts is to show that vitrification of stones, the melting of blocks in structures can happen, even by accident. 
and I believe that this could well be the lost ancient high technology that the Inca or pre-Inca knew about. I generally don't believe in high-tech ancient power tools or lasers or such things, I think there must be a logical explanation. This is a whole area of study that needs careful work, sample testing and geological analysis. And from my armchair in Leicester, England, I can't just go to Peru and take samples. But by being in the UK, I can go and take a closer look at vitrified hill forts in the UK, which could give us some key information to help us interpret the Peruvian stone walls. The rocks used at the various ancient sites of South America include limestone, andesite, rhyolite and so on. The igneous rocks are generally fine grained by nature, although you do find some coarse grained examples like granite at Machu Picchu. The problem with granite is if you melt it you can't reform it, as the magma has to cool slowly to create the large crystals we see. The fine grained equivalent of granite is rhyolite, so if temperatures could be reached to melt granite, the glaze and joints would look like finer rhyolite rock. Any polygonal stone walls made of granite would need a full geological inspection to see if heat was applied. We'd know this by looking at the size of the crystals. Andesite is also an extrusive fine grained rock used in Peruvian architecture, similar to basalt but a different composition. As we can see at the forts in Europe, you can melt very ancient basalt and create new fresh basalt through the process of vitrification. Scientists and archaeologists have seen it and analysed it. So, I'm asking, can we also do the same with the fine grained rhyolites and andesites of Peru? I'm guessing there is a way, a knowledge lost through time and there is strong reason to think this. The rocks of ancient Peru have been vitrified. Many examples of glassy exteriors on stone surfaces and also inside joints are seen. We can also see this vitrification flaking off the faces of stones, which is not what you would expect on natural igneous rocks. Analysis on joints between the rocks also shows that the grain size is smaller, which is what you would expect if the walls were vitrified as the contact points always cool first. It would mean that the ancient Peruvians would not have had to hand carve perfect joints for enormous stone walls, but simply let intense heat melt the rocks to an extent and then let the fluids fill the gaps. Or maybe the blocks could essentially mould together. It may also explain the famous nubs, which in the case of the Peruvian stone walls always look to be at the bottom of the stones in the walls. Remember at the hill fort mentioned how the basalt was described by scientists as having tongue like knobs, like driblets of basalt that escape from the front of a very fluid basalt lava flow. Well, maybe in the case of Peru, these are driblets or outlets for the fluid, to escape the structure when there is nowhere else to go. I'm saying the entire face of the walls, as well as the joints between blocks, was subject to high temperatures. And during vitrification, the fluid would follow gravity, running down each block, accumulating at the bottom at certain places, maybe not on every block, but some of the blocks depending on specific compositions and also zones of the highest heat. At this stage, this video is really just an idea trying to come up with a solution to an age-old conundrum, and I know that researchers like Zamora, and also Peter De Jong and Christopher Jordan, the latter two writing an article for Graham Hancock's website 10 years ago, all believe that heat was used for the ancient Peruvian structures. Whether they used a flux to lower the temperatures needed, whether they covered the walls on the exteriors and interior with a specific combustible material that maybe burns really hot in the right conditions, or whether they coated the walls with a substance and set it on fire once complete, I just don't know. I think an organic compound was used, and I think that this also explains why organic material was found in rock samples from Pumapunku. This organic material was used as evidence by Davidovitz for the use of geopolymer at the ancient Bolivian site, but it is more likely that the inclusion of organic material in an igneous rock is from direct heat and burning applied to the rock.
The application of heat from fires may also explain why ancient Egyptian structures like the Colossi of Memnon are made from a type of hard quartzite. Quartzite being metamorphosed sandstone. Maybe the statues were made with simple sandstone blocks, were then fired at extreme temperatures, melting the sandstone so it could be reformed as a type of quartzite, then finished with stone and metal tools accordingly. There is so much to think about, but I think the key to understanding the most incredible ancient stone structures may lie with a closer inspection of the Iron Age forts of Europe. We know that igneous and sedimentary rocks were melted and reformed by accident by human intervention. But if humans knew this, and could use it in a controlled manner, this knowledge and technology may have been used to make some truly magnificent ancient structures that did stand the test of time. As the scientist from St Andrews University said, sandstone melts at around 900 degrees centigrade, and basalt at 1050 although both are likely to melt at around 1200 degrees due to the impurities in the rock. The heat reached or exceeded these temperatures during the demise of many Iron Age hill forts, showing that even though it was likely by accident, humans could melt entire walls in open air conditions between 800 and 400 BC. If the ancient Peruvians knew this technology, well, it may well explain the precise nature of the ancient polygonal masonry of Peru. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.